right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the breakwater. Um, just a few notes from uh, Africa. Uh, Kurt's doing well. I did hear that they're uh, getting ready to go out on some more missions. They just got back into town, so uh, uh, Irma talked to him a few days ago. So he's doing well. So let's keep him in prayer and the team in prayer, and uh, we wish them a safe journey back. Uh, today we have a special guest, Eden Velasquez. He'll be speaking to us today, spreading the word. So thank you for that. He'll be coming up in a few minutes and uh, give us a little history, of, a background on, him, on himself, and uh, spread the word for us. Uh, so I'd like to read a passage real quick from Psalms 13.3. Uh, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Uh, that was one of my verses of the day, and that kind of hit my heart a little bit. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Uh, if you join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everyone that's here and listening in, Father. We praise uh, you, Father, in all things. We pray for Kurt and the Africa team that you keep them in good spirits, good health, and just wrap them in your protection, Father. Keep them safe, and we welcome them home in a few weeks, and we just pray for a safe journey. Uh, we pray, pray for Eden, Father, that you, uh, we listen to his word and that you open our hearts and minds, and just uh, we pray that you just... Uh, Guard this church and heal those that are in need. And we just thank you for everything. And all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
There is joy in the house of the Lord this morning.
Amen. Even when we don't see it, he is good. So we just declare that in faith this morning, that he is good. don't need you, we need you. And we just call on your name this morning that we know that we can call on your name and we know that your name has power and um, anything that's coming against us this morning, anything that's weighing us down, anything that's um, taking our joy, taking our peace, we know that that is not from God. And we just declare right now that you are in control, that you're you're in control of every situation, every circumstance, whether big or small, and we just trust you in that, in that, knowing that. We just trust in belief, knowing that you are in control. We give you this time this morning. We thank you for the sermon. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Hello, before uh, Eden comes up, I, I got to talk to Kurt this morning and a couple days ago, so I just want to give you guys a quick prayer update. We can pray for Pastor Kurt. And um, so I talked to him Friday or Saturday, and they were in the middle of doing a bunch of malaria tests, which was cool because they're a bunch of failures. They're all excited about that. They failed the malaria test. Um, it's based on the Jacob protocol because Jacob almost died coming back one time because he didn't get malaria tested. Um, so right now the team is down to Chris, Kurt, and there's three ladies. And those three ladies will be leaving, I think, Wednesday. So prayer request they have is for health. There's been some stomach bugs going around. So Kurt and Chris are um, asking for prayer for just sustained health on their bellies. They're feeling good. Um, they're going down to a place called Insanje. And every time I've been there, there's been a lot of malaria. It's like a lot of kind of marshy, a lot of mosquitoes. And there's a lot of HIV down there, like a lot. So uh, that's not our main focus, but just be, be praying for a lot of, you know, the people that are going to be interacting there is a good chance a lot of them are dealing with that kind of stuff, uh, HIV and um, malaria, a lot of mosquitoes. And so they're going to be going down, I think, Wednesday. And also, Chris uh, mentioned a prayer request for him. He's like, we're so busy, and so many good things are happening, but it's, like, amazing how that sometimes takes away from your intimate time with God. And um, it's like, well, we're doing so much for the, like, we're focusing on the gospel, and we're, we're helping so many people, but it's almost like the enemy's like, well, you don't need to be seeking me. You don't need to be dependent on me, right? So he's just asking for prayer to be more, like, desiring dependency on God. And kind of what you were singing, too, which was really beautiful. So I'm going to pray a blessing on those guys. You're going to join me as we pray for Kurt as he's kind of at the halfway point. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to keep working. So Heavenly Father, thank you for the, the victory upon victory as, as, they've, uh, as the team has been successful in reaching so many people with the successful water projects, with the successful medical team, with uh, your spirit moving powerfully and delivering people and healing people and saving souls through the, the ministry of uh, the gospel and the Jesus film, and Lord, I thank you for the unity that you've blessed the team with. There's been so much joy. Thank you for the healings of uh, against uh, any sicknesses that have happened, and thank you for all the negative uh, co um, malaria tests. And as um, Chris and Kurt are going to be continuing on, uh, forcefully advancing the kingdom, I'm asking that you would bless them, give them wisdom. Give them, Lord, discernment how to overcome the many decisions and challenges that are going to come their way. I pray they would not be shook by this, but they would be dependent on you. I thank you, Father. They're going to seek you first. They're going to seek you in the storm, whatever that may look like. Lord, I pray that they would not be distracted with good things from, be, from the best thing, and that is being intimate at your feet, Lord. So thank you for the opportunity they had to go to Nsanjay. I pray that people's hearts would be ready, fertile soil. as the Lord, you said pray for the harvesters. Lord, because the harvest is great and the harvesters are few, Lord. So we're sending out Chris and Kurt, Lord, to expand your kingdom. I'm asking, Father, um, Lord, for, yeah, the whatever hurts and HIV-related stuff that may be going on in, the, in that air region, Lord, I pray, Father, for, for you to, to show up big. And I, I'm excited for the testimonies that they're going to have. We're excited for the, the unity you're going to continually have in their, in their team. And I pray you'd bless them in the almighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Check, check, check. All right, you guys can hear me in the back? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. You're in like the second row though, bro. How to, Les, can you hear me? Yeah. Sweet. All right, good. Let me get set up here quick. Make sure this thing works. Oh, there was supposed to be pics of all dedications there. Not anymore. All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Eden Velasquez, as Scott mentioned, and as some of you know me. Um, welcome to the Breakwater Mega Embassy Church. You guys know Kurt's away, so it falls on me to say that. We are mega because we love Jesus a lot, and we're an embassy because we're ambassadors for Christ. So um, thank you, Chris, for the update on how Kurt and the team are doing. You guys know what he's doing there. You guys know the mission there. You guys know the involvement that this church has had there for the past, I mean, over 25 years being instrumental in the provision of putting hands and feet to the gospel. I think it's just so beautiful to see the gospel be enacted in the way that 
that Jesus lived it out too. Jesus did not just cruise by people and say, you know, be healed and then leave them sick or, you know, be fed and then leave them hungry. He healed people. He fed people. He provided for their physical needs as well as providing for their biggest, our biggest spiritual need by dying on the cross and resurrecting and restoring that path for us to have relationship with him. So that's the gospel right there. And it's amazing. So my name is Eden Velasquez, as I said before. For those of you that don't know me or haven't heard my story, I'll just take a minute to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm married to this beautiful lady sit in the front. Her name is Christina. And she is pregnant with our firstborn kid, who's due October 22nd. Thank you, Jesus. So my family is also sitting right over there. That's my grandparents and my, my parents right there. So there's three generations of Jesus following Velasquez's with a fourth on the way. Yeah. May that chain never break and may all of us have lines that continue on to eternity of people who love Jesus in our families. So, let me see. That's a picture of my family. That's kind of like, there's other members as well, like aunties and cousins and all that, but that was me and Christina on our wedding day. And that's kind of like the core, closest crew of our family. That's like, that's the kind of the core group of the Velasquez slash Vilches, which is my mom's side of the family. Um, that's not my wife's side. My bad, though. That's also a huge part of the family. Anyways, so I grew up in a smallish town in southern Mexico called Puerto Escondido. Uh, and I grew up there as a missionary and pastor's kid. And my family was there for about 20 years. I lived there personally from ages about 3 to 7 and then 10 to 21. And it was an amazing place to grow up. I don't regret growing up there at all, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. It was paradise. And the people that I got to grow up around, the, just the cultural diversity, as well as the epic food and great waves that are there, is just, you can't beat it. So that's where I spent my childhood, my formative years. And so having grown up in a, you know, a missionary household and a, kind of like my parents were pastors as well, I was surrounded all the time. There's always some sort of prayer meeting or church service or VBS or just something like gospel related. So I was exposed to the good news from a very early age. And there wasn't really a time that I can remember without, you know, knowing for sure, like, Jesus is king. I think I accepted him when I was like seven years old, hearing this like little VBS style, like cassette tape for kids. And I was like, Jesus, I invite you to my heart. But when I was 13 is when my parents kind of sat me down and explained to me that relationship with Jesus is not something that you're like grandfathered into. Meaning if my parents are solid, that doesn't mean I'm solid. So that was at that point I decided to, to follow Jesus, not just to proclaim that I was his, but to actually live it out. And from that point on, during my later teen years and up until now, the Lord just consistently and continually grew me and solidified my faith in Him and then just my confidence in who He is as well as my standing with Him, that I am, that I am saved. I've, I struggled a lot for a long time just with whether or not I was saved. So I went to missionary school at the age of 21. It's called YWAM in Kona. We have some friends there right now. My sister is actually prepping to go staff a school there as well. And so I spent two years there studying the Bible, apologetics, cross-cultural relations, Bible teaching, communications, and other related fields. And I left with an associates in Christian ministry with an emphasis in biblical studies. So all of that experience, in addition to having grown up in the mission field, has left me and my family with a strong desire and passion to be deeply involved in missions. So that's kind of a little bit about myself. Um, here we go. So now moving on to the message part itself. Excuse me. Oh, it's been a while since I've spoken in front of people, and there's always the jitters that you got to get out. But once I get on the roll, guys, it'll be good. So the renewal of the mind, the will of God, and the love of God. Those are the three things that I want to talk about today. I'm just going to repeat it again because Pete and Repeat are the two best teachers, my dad always said. The renewal of the mind, the will of God, and the love of God. So, renewing your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm just going to read it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, Kind of starting out with, 
you know, why is it important to, kind of making a case for why is it important to renew our minds? So what does it mean to be conformed to the patterns of this world or to the, be conformed to this world and our thinking? Well, this is the dictionary definition of to be conformed. So it means to be similar or identical, to be obedient or compliant, or to act in accordance with prevailing customs or standards. So basically, it means to be like something. So when it says to not be conformed to the world, it means don't be like the world. And what is the world like? Just think about that for a minute. You know, just, yeah, evil. There's tons of nasty stuff when we think of the stuff that's in the world and that's of the world, right? So it's, I mean, we can, debauchery, murder, rapes, there's genocide, there's disease from the evil that we've brought into the world, there's injustice, there's abortion, there's tons of just awful things. And I would make a case that all of this stuff, all of these things that are terrible, they all have this consistent theme or this consistent like thread that ties them all together, and that is selfishness. So when somebody steals something, they're not thinking of how that's going to affect the person that they're stealing from. They're thinking about themselves, how this can benefit me right now. When somebody murders somebody for revenge, let's say, they're not thinking of how that's going to affect the person's family or their own family in the future generations. They're thinking about what they want in that moment right then. So we can see that there's this consistent thread that is selfishness, that the world actually teaches us to be selfish. Have you guys ever heard of the saying, you know, look out for number one, right? Look out for number one. Nobody else is going to look out for you except you, right? So the world is actually consistently training us to think selfishly. But Jesus did not leave that example for us. Our lives as followers of Christ are not supposed to reflect look out for number one, but look out for the real number one because he's looking after you. So Jesus, his life lived out was not an example of selfishness or self-focused living or self-centered actions. His life was one of selflessness and one that was focused on glorifying God and being obedient to what his will was for his son and for the world. So that's kind of why it's necessary to be renewed in our minds because in addition to just the way that the world thinks, we all come from different different cultures, right? We come from different family cultures. We all have different likes, jobs, interests, past lives, sins that we used to live in, habits, good and bad. All of these things have trained our minds to think a certain way. And whether we want to admit it or not, our minds are always being influenced. Think about the... I mean, in my own case, the music that I listen to or the shows that I watch, like these little words pop up into my brain randomly from like songs that I don't even want to be thinking about sometimes. Or this little image from this show that I watch will like pop in and I'll just be like, whoa, like I wasn't even trying to think about that. So our minds are constantly being influenced and whether our minds are being trained or influenced for righteousness or worldliness, that's for up to us to decide as followers of Christ. Now, the mind in ancient Greek is like nose or nose. I'm not good at ancient Greek, sorry. But it means mind, understanding, or reason. So to be transformed by the renewal of the mind, what does that mean? Good. So how do we do it? Well, reading, hearing, these are all great ways. Lucky for us, or super fortunate for us, it's laid out really plain and simple in the Bible. I'm so thankful that God did not make this thing complicated. Like, I'm so, so stoked. I, we, I have complicated following Jesus so many times in my, throughout my walk with Christ. But God didn't make it difficult, or God didn't make it complicated to follow him. It's hard, for sure, but it's not complicated. So... The Bible tells us how to renew our minds. You guys ready for it? You guys ready for the step-by-step -step yeah, instructions for how to renew your mind? <laughs> All right, here it is. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is 
anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's Philippians 4, 8 through 9. It's simple, guys. So here it is. Think about these things. What is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise? That's it. Sermon done. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So this is how we do it. And guys, this is a spiritual discipline. So this is something that we need to be practicing. It's not a Sunday for an hour and a half thing. It's not a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or whatever day of the week you have a Bible study on. It's not just for those times. It's something that we need to be disciplining every single day. The same way that, you know, we train our bodies for work or our minds for study or an athlete trains to, a runner trains to run a marathon. It's a matter of consistency, something that we need to be exercising every single day. We need to be disciplining our minds and bringing them into submission to the will of God. Because oftentimes, at least I found, I was actually speaking to my wife yesterday about this, oftentimes our own minds can be our worst enemies. We can be our biggest inflator of our egos or our harshest critics to the point where it's just not true that how, to the extent that we're criticizing ourselves. So we need to, uh, Pastor Kurt has told me a couple times, he said, you know, we need to make our minds our friend. So we need to be making sure that we're training our mind to be thinking about, you know, godly things and not the way that that the world so often tries to train us into thinking. So a way that I've actually been able to practice this, practice thinking upon these things, practice thinking on being renewed in the mind has been by disciplining my mind towards gratitude. So my emotions, our emotions as humans are so fickle, it can be up or down one day to the next and just for no apparent reason, you know what I mean? Like, oh, today I'm in a good mood, tomorrow I'm in a bad mood, but like the sun's still shining and like I have food and I have water and I have all the stuff that I had the day before, but for some reason I don't feel good. So God has showed me this way to be disciplined by just giving him thanks in all situations. And so regardless of, you know, whether it's my car broke down and it's really lame that I have to fork over the money to pay for, to fix the car or, you know, something as extreme as, you know, losing a friend to cancer or something as light as I just woke up and didn't want to go to work today. God has taught me to be thankful for just to shift my mind away from or the, from the focus on ways that I would tend to be self-centered and focus on the good that he is. So, for example, say my car broke down. I'll pray prayers like, you know, Jesus, thank you that, you know, in spite of my car breaking down, I still have enough finances to cover it and not starve. You know, I still have enough money for food and shelter. And thank you, Lord, that I have, you know, friends and family who I can rely on for support if I need it. You know, thank you, Jesus, that, you know, for my life. Thank you that you're good. Thank you that, you know, I, I know you, that I'm able to follow you. Just see how like that, that, see how drastically different that is from being like, oh man, my car broke down. This sucks. My mood is terrible. Now I got to pay for this thing. Now, you know, that sets back my financial plans a month and a half. Now, you know, all this stuff that just kind of gets you in like a, a washing machine cycle of like just self-centered focus and just this pattern of thinking that doesn't really lead you towards following Christ anymore, or at least doesn't lead me towards following Christ anymore. So that's the kind of stuff that in my own life I've done is to just just be thankful in all situations. So something I want to point out about this list is that there is not, self-centered thinking is not on this list. I want you guys to notice something about this list that it there is no self-pity on here. There's no meditating on past things that have hurt you. There's no, what about me in this, in this list, right? Again, it's because the way that the world wants to train our minds is towards selfishness. And the way that the God wants to train our minds is towards selflessness, right? So I have a question to challenge you guys, having just clearly laid out, you know, what, how to renew your mind. And I'm going to just take a couple minutes to just pause. Is how are you going to practice this? I want you guys to take like two minutes and actually think about it because honestly, guys, you know, we can gather on Sundays, we can, you know, we can meet together for Bible studies, we can worship, we can sing all the words, we can read all the chapters, but unless we're putting it into practice, 
our lives aren't becoming any more like Christ and what we say we are, we're not actually living out. So I want you guys to just take a couple minutes, like I'll call us back in like two minutes, but just meditate on how you're actually going to practice putting this renewal of the mind, and I'll put the list back up, how you're going to practice it. All right, now I want you guys to find a person to share how you're going to be practicing that with. Just find somebody. If you don't have somebody right next to you, then get up and find somebody. It's that way because it's important to keep each other accountable, right? I'm just going to lay out real quick what mine is so that you guys can all keep me accountable to it too. For people who are going to cut me off or <laughs> anger me in traffic, I'm just going to say a quick prayer to, prayer to bless them rather than being like, it's going to start there, but then it's going to go, Jesus, just bless that guy with your love. Just draw them closer to you. So that's going to be mine. <laughs> All right, guys, start wrapping it up. All right, guys. So, as you guys have shared with each other what you're going to practice, how you're going to practice it, text each other throughout the week or next time you see each other, be like, how's that going? And, you know, not like in a poking, like, oh, are you still, like, like, like in a legitimate, because we're all here to encourage each other, right? That's what we're here for. As the body of Christ, we're here to grow and we're here to help each other grow. So when we see each other, let's, you know, 
like obviously there's room for humor, but let's be like, hey guys, like like legitimately, how are you doing with that? Because this is important. This is how we actually grow and become more like Jesus, guys, which is the whole point. Christians, like Christ, that's what we're supposed to be. So I want to speak a word of encouragement to you guys as well with this, that as you guys are practicing these things, first of all, start with something. You can start with something small, and you don't have to worry about you know, doing all of the stuff at the same time. Nobody f- runs a marathon without taking the first step and no one finishes a marathon without taking it a step at a time. Guys, growth is our goal. Becoming more like Christ is our, is our goal. So if you're growing one step at a time, that's growth. You're actually fulfilling God's will for your life by becoming more like Him. So just take heart in the fact that if you fail, if you fail at these things, like a runner, when he falls... That doesn't stop him from being a runner, right? He just gets up and continues running. So if you fall, just know that that doesn't regress you all of the growth that you've just had. It just means that, hey, you failed. Just okay. Get back up up and keep running. So, and also to remember that your failures don't define you. Jesus defines you. So what you do after those failures, you know, am I going to sit and sulk in the fact that I haven't been practicing this, or am I going to pick myself up, thank God that his goodness is sufficient for me, his blood is sufficient for me, and that he's allowed me and enabled me to continue to live like him. So here's the word of encouragement, guys. As we're practicing these things, as we are putting these things into our daily lives, into our daily routines, right there, the last part of verse 9, check that out. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that so cool? God's with us. Like when at, in the midst of our growing, he doesn't just leave us to he doesn't just say, "Okay, go do it." And then like, "Haha, they fell. Oh, look, they're not doing it right." He's there with us every single step of the way. He actually promises that as we're growing, as we're taking these actions, he's going to be with us. I like peace. Do you guys like peace? Yeah. I'm yes. I'm pretty down for some more peace. So practice these things, guys. And the God of peace, that guy, that God, not guy, God, (laughs) that God will be with you. So that's just beautiful. That's that's, that's really encouraging to me. That's amazing. All right, so we're kind of coming to the end of the renewal of the mind portion of it. And so do not be conformed to this world. This is the last part of Romans 12 too, which is the passage that we started with. But, but, But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We just talked about that. By testing and discerning. You may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the next part that we're going to talk about is the will of God. Now, what is the will of God? Sweet. Keep it simple. I like it. So often, we complicate it. Again, Christians, we tend to complicate things. I, myself, when I was in Bible school, somebody would ask, you know, what is God's will? And you'd be like, dude, how much time you got? Like, this is going to be like a three-hour, like, talk right now. And we're going to, you know, we might end up with an I don't know. That's like how, uh, how much we complicate it. But again, guys, God did not make following him complicated. He made it simple. It's not easy all the time, but it's simple. So, the testing and dis- the testing and the discerning that the last part of Romans twelve two will help us to discern and decide what it is that God wants us to do in each of our little daily lives. You know the little ins and outs of everybody's life that we do every day. But there's God leaves very clear instructions throughout scriptures of what the big you know uppercase W will is for all of our lives in every circumstance, regardless of who you are or where you come from or what circumstance you're in. God leaves us very clearly what his will is for us. So, here's a few passages that lay out the will of God clearly and in no uncertain terms. And we're just going to go through them quickly because honestly, each passage can and has been a whole sermon on its own. So, for this is the will of God. Here we go. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. See the red letters, guys? That's Jesus. I, there, there's a really good passage that I like, and he always says, you know, keep your theology red letter. Have a red letter theology. So if it's in red, it's probably a good thing to base your thoughts and your beliefs on. So that's straight up Jesus right there, guys. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And we know God, Jesus only did the will of the Father who sent him. So he came so that all who would look on him would have eternal life, and he would raise him up on the last day, and he came to seek and save the lost. So that's all part of it. So, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Guys, it's just staggering how many passages are just very clearly lay out what God's will is. And how it's amazing to me how often we tend to, you know, confuse it or complicate it. Now, my summary to all of these passages... This is super condensed, super, you know, Eden summary. Is that God's will is simply this. Is that all would come to him and become more like him. In our minds, our thoughts, and our actions. In every single way. That's God's will. And if you look at the consistent theme in all of these things, God wants that all would be saved. That all would come to the saving knowledge and relationship with him. And that through that relationship, we would become increasingly more transformed and more conformed to his image. That we would reflect Christ to every single person around us. So all of that as well, though, goes back to, I'm sorry, I got lost in my notes. That's God's will for us. (laughs) So it's simple. It's simple, guys. Now, what does it mean, though, to be more like God? What is God like? You know, that begs the question, right? So if we're supposed to become more like God, what is he like? So I'm going to put up a passage that just kind of, Kind of breaks it down. Beloved, let us love one another. For love, I'm sorry, different. There we go. This is getting into the third part. Because going into what is God like, we know that God is love. And so this is the third section, right? The love of God. So what is God like? Here we go. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So, we could see very clearly from here that what, what is God like? He's loving. He is love. But how does the Bible define love? You know, we hear so many different definitions. You know, we say, we, oh, I love that burger. I love that taco place. I love my car. I love, you know, love is love. But what is love, right? The Bible defines it as, this is a list from 1 Corinthians 13, super famous passage, right? Love is patient, kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, does not insist on its own way. I have trouble with that one sometimes, especially around my siblings. <laughs> not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And love never ends. So that's how the Bible defines love. And that's the kind of love that Jesus actually exemplifies and actually acts out for us in his life and ministry. Now, I'm going to talk straight for a minute with you guys and to myself, honestly. Don't give yourself any excuse to live a life that is not looking like everything on this list. If we are supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, we are reflecting Him, we are part of His body, then this is the standard and this is what we're called to. Anything, any excuse, it doesn't matter what it is. It's not from the Lord. You know, we can think of, I've thought up excuses for myself, you know, it's, but yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. Yeah, but 
You don't know how so-and-so hurt me or offended me or wounded me. Yeah, but you just haven't experienced the same things that I have. Like if you would just experience what I've experienced, then you would know that you know, it's, I have to insist on my own way. It's not from the Lord, guys. That is straight up enemy, <laughs> lies from the enemy. All of these excuses are just disgusting lies that keep us from growing into what God intended for us to be as his image bearers and children. So don't fall into this trap of thinking, guys. Live and love like Jesus. Look to this list. Renew your minds and live like this. And now, going back to that, that other passage, 1 John 4, 7 through 12, he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or like substitute, like the payment for our sins. So that action... That kind of love that Jesus exemplified, again, was not self-centered, but it was selfless. It was sacrificial. So this is the kind of love that Jesus displayed. It was humble, self-sacrificial, putting others first kind of love. And it was the kind of love that was confident the Lord's way, which is put others first, is the best way. So this is the kind of love that Jesus enacted, right? And I'm going to close with this. This is the kind of love that we're called to, who though he, Jesus, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This part giving me chills every single time I read it. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen, dude. Oh, God's so good, you guys. So this is the kind of love that Jesus exemplified for us in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, the pinnacle of his ministry, you guys, the pinnacle of his love and his life for us was his death and his resurrection on the cross. And what did it exemplify? It exemplified this kind of love. So, so that's what Jesus loves like and that's who God is like. And if you have not given your life to the Lord, if you haven't surrendered to this love, if you haven't received this love, then I just want to encourage you to do so now, like in this closing prayer. We're going to close right now, and it's just everyone just bow your heads, close your eyes. We're just going to close with this. Jesus, you can just repeat after me, right? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and for your sacrifice on the cross. We surrender our lives to you and repent of the ways we've missed the mark of your example. Please fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and I'm just going to end in prayer quick and just bless you guys. The worship team has a couple more songs they can come back up. But I'm just going to bless you guys. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you that you're a good God and that the example that you left, what you called us into, Lord, is not burdensome, it's not hard, and it's not bad. Thank you, Jesus, that you've literally exemplified and you lived out the best way possible to live. You showed us what it means to truly be human in the way that we were designed to be humans, Lord. So, Jesus, I ask that you would just fill every single one of us up with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please come fill us up and just remind us, Lord, convict us of ways that we need to change. And please just continue to equip us to live and to love like you, Lord. May people see us, see every single person here. And when they look at us, go, man, that guy looks like Jesus. Help us to accurately and to truly represent you to the people that we work with, to the people that we see on the street, to the people that we come across in restaurants, Lord. Just help us to exemplify you in every waking moment of our lives, Lord. We say that we are yours and that we love you. Holy Spirit, please continue to advance your kingdom here in the South Bay, in Malawi, and to the ends of the earth. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.
Jesus, the name above all names. We thank you that you rose again so that we could live a victorious life here on this earth, that you just didn't die and, and our, our God just didn't die, but you resurrected from the grave and you gave us hope and you gave us the power, the resurrection power that lives within each one of us. We have that in us and we just bring that out of us. We just allow that spirit, we allow that power to flow through us this morning and throughout our day, throughout our week. We thank you for that power. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eden, for your wonderful. 